the Virginia Horse Industry Board, Southwest Virginia Agricultural Association, and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. Some crop producers are switching to continuous no-till systems, saving these farmers time and money. Officials say no-till farming benefits the land, restores soil health, and dramatically reduces runoff and erosion. We're going to see a video that shows the result of no-till farming is more profitable and more productive farms and better water quality downstream. Later in the show, we'll learn about growing tasty tomatoes when we go in the garden. We'll also highlight youth and agriculture, visit our destination spotlight, and have a minute in the field video. That's what's coming up on this edition of Virginia Farming. No-till farming is having some positive effects, both monetarily and environmentally. Let's take a look as no-till farmers tell their stories of success. This area has been farmed for hundreds of years. Um, and so uh, there's, there's great benefit and value in what's here. How can I improve it? And you know, hopefully when my kids take over the farm, I've got better ground than what I'm standing on now. It, everything is yield driven. Everything is economic driven. So this no-till is making economic sense. Or we wouldn't be going down this road. We would have to abandon this road if it weren't um, paying off for us by making us more efficient, leaner, meaner, using less resources to produce more crops. You know, we really have a, uh, a system that's working and we're, we're actually helping the environment. With continuous no-till, we spend half the time on the tractors we used to. We're spending a lot more time with our families. We're farming the same amount of land or more land in less time and making, making more money. More and more farmers all across Virginia are making the switch to soil building, continuous no-till systems. These farmers are cutting costs and saving time by planting all of their crops year in and year out without tillage. They're also maximizing the soil benefits that come with less disturbance by adding in cover crops, crop rotation, and other practices. As diverse as they are, one thing these farmers all have in common they tell us that they are gaining ground. My name is Samuel Gehring, and uh, my grandfather bought the farm, and, and uh, so I'm third generation. Uh, we milk 175 cows, and we have about an acre per cow of cropland. And the no-till has worked real well in that. Uh, switched to no-till some fields over 20 years now, and everything's been never tilled for at least 10. So that's where we are with our, uh, you know, our tillage program. We let the earthworms do it. My name is Cecil Byram, and uh, I am the president of Byram Family Farm, which includes three entities, uh, my father, my son, and myself. And um, we farm 2,000 plus acres under one management, and we share the equipment. When we first started growing cotton in the early 90s, we were told you had to rip and bed and clean till all the cotton. Through technology advancements, we were able to go to less tillage with the cotton and we went to strip till. And now a good part of our cotton is produced 100% no-till. 
My name is uh, Jay Hunley, and uh, this is a family farm. We go in the name of Cloverfield Enterprises, and it consists of my brother, my father, and myself. And we farm roughly 7,000 acres, growing corn, soybeans, wheat, barley. Uh, my philosophy on tillage is do not till. Uh, I don't ever want to see the soil turned if, if any way, shape, or form, if possible. And uh, I think no-till is the only way to go. Well, we are contract raising Holstein heifers. Um, we keep around 400 head. Since we've gone to no-till, I've seen some very positive responses. Uh, some people seem to think that making the switch from conventional to no-till, you'll see a yield drag. We did not see that. My name is Paul Davis, uh, retired extension agent after 28 years with uh, Virginia Tech as a crop and soil scientist. I grew up here on the, the family farm. Uh, we're located right here on the Pamunkey River. Uh, the farm has 1,200 acres, but my father and I farm about 250 of it. We have converted every acre that we farmed into continuous no-till, and it has a cover crop on it. I'm Anthony Beery. Uh, we farm uh, about 450 acres. We have 300 head of dairy cows, and we have some poultry as well. I mean, a lot of what we hear today is, is aimed at water quality. How do we improve water quality? And I feel like we're getting there with some of the practices that we're using. With this continuous no-till, we're making the water stay where it, where it falls. We're making the soil a sponge. We're, we're, we're keeping the water here. We're keeping the nutrients here. We're growing organic matter in the soil. We're growing uh, better crops because of it. And it's, it's a win-win all the way around. My name is Dale Holland. I farm in Suffolk, Virginia. My son and I, we farm about 2,200 acres. About 95% of it is no-till, and some of, it is, some of it has been in no-till for 30 years. There are just so many benefits, I don't, even, I don't even know where you would stop at, you know. Even if I had to pay you to let me plant no-till, I would plant no-till, you know. So that's the way it is. We're farming more land. Than, than, than this farm has ever farmed in its history. We're doing it with less people than it's ever been done, and we're doing it with less horsepower. In the spring, I don't have to worry about plowing. I don't have to worry about disking it down, harrowing, you know, all these things that, that we need to do when we're in a tillage system. Just the two of us do all the, all the planting and all the harvesting and spraying, and we couldn't, we couldn't do that if it was conventional till. You know, you, we'd probably have to have three more people. Invariably, when we worked the ground, we pulled up a lot of rocks, and I've picked up so many rocks on this farm that, you know, I just was tired of it, and my son was tired of it, and so yeah, there, there is a, a big time savings. And also, in the, in, in the fall last year, we were, we were extremely wet. I could pick, and the people that they were conventional till, they, they couldn't, they'd have to wait weeks to be able to do it. And I could get three or four inches of rain, a couple of days, I could be back on the, on the ground, you know, going. Over the, the years uh, with continuous no-till, we've really seen the benefit of our soil quality getting better and better. We've always known that no-till farming can reduce erosion by water and wind. But what we're finding out is these continuous no-till systems aren't just saving topsoil, they're literally rebuilding it. Rebuilding soil organic matter, soil life, and a more natural, stable sponge structure, the three key components of topsoil. We were working our soil, and I kind of concluded that we were just beating our soil to death. And now you can take a shovel or a spade out in the fields and, and you can dig and there's, you can about always find earthworm passages. Uh, the, the soil just, just has a, a structure to it that it didn't have before. Uh, to, to me, when you have all those earthworms in there, it's, it's like running a, a subsoil, you know, to, to open it up. So to me, every year, just it just gets better, you know, you know the, the soil does. So. I've seen the soil become this sponge that, that actually takes in the water instead of dumping it off down in the river or the creek or the, or the bottom of the field. That's one of the long-term benefits of the no-till. If we can keep that water in the field, especially in that, for the benefit of that crop when that crop is growing, then it, it's a win-win situation. 
To fully appreciate the potential runoff and erosion from a conventionally tilled field like this, you really need to be out here during the most intense thunderstorm of the year. Since most people aren't willing to do that, here in Virginia, we use a rainfall simulator to help our farmers tell the story of what happens when it rains really hard. On the left, we start with a tray of dry, loose soil taken from a clean till field. On the right, we start with a slice of intact surface soil from a long-term no-till field. This soil is not only protected with a mulch of cover crop residue, it also has a stable porous sponge structure. You know, years ago as a kid, I remember, you know, you'd get these, these big heavy thunderstorms in the summer and it would just, it would just wash the field and you'd end up with, with mud down on the road. And I'm talking about mud that you'd go over there with a the skid loader and scoop out of the way so the cars could go down the road. What I'm seeing now is I'm seeing these heavy rainfalls and I'm barely seeing a trickle coming out of the field. After we simulate an extremely intense thunderstorm for five minutes, the differences are obvious. Most of the water we apply to this soil has run off into this jar, carrying away with it a thin but very significant layer of topsoil. We just applied an inch and a half of very intense rainfall to this bare, tilled soil. Obviously, we harvested very little for future plant use. Meanwhile, this no-till soil has absorbed virtually every drop of water we applied. What little ran off is clear. The bottom line is pretty simple. If you want to harvest more rain like these no-till farmers are doing, keep your soil covered on top and make it a sponge underneath. Air yields, as far as I'm concerned, air yields have increased due to the no-till uh, because of the water holding capacity where we used to work it up. The soils would dry out faster, uh, the organic matter is better, which is going to increase yields. With proper planning and the technology available today, most Virginia farmers can make the initial switch to continuous no-till without a yield reduction. As soils improve over time, farmers are seeing healthier crops and better yields. We just don't see the issues where you have yellow corn in the spring and you think it's going to be a, you know, nitrogen will take care of it. Uh, Maybe it was a compaction issue, maybe it wasn't nitrogen deficiency, but we just don't have those issues like we used to have. In, in the last 10 years, our yields continue to go up. I'd say they've gone up 25%, and we accredit it to the continuous no-till and the, the cover crops. You're not gonna see it overnight, but if you give it enough time and just start working with it, it's definitely a plus. I would not never go back to conventional tillage. The continuous no-till, I'd say, is the number one issue. Stop tilling, and then as soon as you get comfortable with that, jump right into having cover crops. That is a next step to increase your yields. Making the switch to continuous no-till will involve costs and challenges that will vary from farm to farm. But one of the keys to success for many Virginia no-tillers has been to take a systems approach. Not just parking the plow, but also adding to the farming system other practices proven to make no-till work better. Three of the most important, cover crops, crop rotation, and compaction prevention. Uh, I think foremost in my mind and maybe most dairy farmers minds is compaction because of, of the manure that we take it back out to the field. Um, so we've, we've really tried to focus on eliminating that compaction before it happens rather than going back and fixing a problem. We're also looking at, at the broader spectrum, the whole system if you will, um, and, and maybe uh, seeing what benefits we can get from a tillage radish uh, with some of these other deeply rooted plants, al alfalfa rotations, those kind of things, trying to, trying to think outside the box of, of just a conventional tillage option. 
Cover crops to me is one of the best things that you can do. It's anything that was left in the soil after you've harvested your crop, the cover crop should capture those nutrients, hold them in that plant. And of course it helps with putting organic matter back in the soil. And you've got to remember the soil is alive. That's what it is. It's nothing but an organism. It's a living thing, pretty much. And you need to feed it just like you do any other thing that you raise in that field. An open mind is one of the biggest assets you can have in agriculture. And always be flexible and always be looking for a better wheel. There is no going back to clean tillage. Economics is not going to allow it. And we know so much more and we have tools to work with. It's important to use those tools wisely and be a good steward of the tools as well as the land. I believe that it's made me a better farmer and a better conservationist. I just enjoy farming now. I just, I don't know, when one year gets done, I'm just ready to go into the next one. We love this land. We love what we do. We feel like uh, we're some of the chosen few because we, we're still on the farm. We want to make this place a better place for our children and our grandchildren. The next generation hopefully will come on and they'll be able to prosper and pick it up and run right along with it. So, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a big circle. You know, and everybody's, everybody's in it. Tomatoes come in so many tasty varieties. Let's find out about growing, caging, and preparing those tasty tomatoes with Mark Viette in the garden. Whether you buy your own tomatoes or you grow your own tomatoes, there are a couple neat things that you can do, especially if you're entertaining friends or family. What I like to do is uh, grow a variety of different tomatoes, maybe one of each of anywhere from 10. I grow, in fact, about 42 types. You might not want that many. But what you do is when you pick them when they're ripe and you come on in and you slice them and you create a whole meal with just tomatoes as maybe even an appetizer and you just slice your tomatoes just like this and you put them on a plate and I love the golden tomatoes these are just really great and each tomato has a different flavor different consistency this is very thick and I'm gonna come in here and get another one of my favorites green zebra and usually when it comes like I'll remove the bottom part and we won't serve that but then I'll sometimes come in here on a cutting board and just cut a nice big slice of green zebra and I'll just arrange them on a plate. And so when I'm done, I just have a beautiful assortment of tomatoes. And they really do taste differently. This one here has a very distinct flavor so you can taste them. Mmm, fantastic. But it's an easy way to serve a whole meal or an appetizer that's very attractive. Let's go look at a couple growing tips that'll help you have the best tomato. Tomatoes perform the best in cages for me, but the real key is to make sure that you have large cages. These cages are at least 30, and I might even recommend 36, and I'm even thinking of going to 40 inches in diameter. I made these cages myself because they're hard to find that are, that are really substantial and sturdy and they need to make sure you have openings in so you can pick the tomatoes. But when you plant your tomatoes, it's important to set the cage right then and there. The other thing that I've learned over the years is the farther you space your cages and plants apart, the better the production, the more production you'll get and the nicer and more attractive fruit you'll get, and even you'll get a more extended production. So don't be afraid to put your cages four to five feet apart. In fact, sometimes I like to put them six feet apart. Plant a lot less tomatoes, plant them farther apart, and you'll have enough plant tomatoes to give to all your neighbors. 
Many of us will face a common problem in growing tomatoes, especially growing the heirloom tomatoes, which I almost call a disease magnet. These are varieties that have been handed down year after year because of their flavor and their taste and their size. You know, some tomatoes will get two or three pounds, maybe even four pounds or larger. But what you find with these tomatoes is they don't have the disease resistance built into them like some of the newer forms. So you've got to keep your eye out for disease. And one of the most common diseases that we're going to see in our gardens is known as early blight or late blight. And that's where the bottom portion of the plant, the leaves start turning yellow. They get a little bit of spots to them and then they completely die back. A couple things you can do is keep those leaves picked off in many cases by hand, some cases by shears, but these are just coming off. So you can clean them up as the disease progresses. Or you can use fungicides according to label directions if you do use fungicides. The key with a lot of fungicides is that you have to use them as a preventative. So mark your calendar when you experience these problems in your garden and then so you know next year, well, you know, two weeks prior to that, maybe I need to use a preventative for my diseases. Just a couple other things to help you grow the very best tomatoes. I don't plant mine early in the season. I sometimes don't even plant them till July 1st. There's nothing gained by planting early. Plant them when the nights are above 50 degrees in temperature. The other advantage to cages is I don't have to prune my tomatoes. I just take the new shoots or the shoots that grow outside the cage and just gently bend them in, just kind of put them in and hook them on a leaf just like that. And really, as you see here, I really need a cage that might be three feet taller. The other thing is you always have to have a favorite tomato. And one of my favorites is the garden peach. It looks, it feels like a peach. It's even fuzzy. You know, just fill a bowl facing one way and, you know, have one of your friends come in and just say, try one of my new peaches. And the seeds will explode everywhere, but it's got the very best flavor. I'm Mark Viet. Join me next time in the garden. Virginia Farming is on Facebook. Search for us, like us, and stay informed on two of the most important economic features of Virginia, agriculture and the environment. Facebook, we'll see you there. All-terrain vehicles have become very popular with farmers in Virginia. An ATV is an excellent tool to round up cattle, but farmers should always consider safety when using an ATV. Experts recommend wearing proper safety gear while riding ATVs. This includes a helmet with a full face shield or goggles, sturdy boots that come over the ankle, and a pair of sturdy gloves to protect your hands. To learn more about farm safety practices, contact Virginia Farm Bureau at VAFB.com. This week, our youth in agriculture are actually adults. I'd like to give a big shout out to all FFA advisors, statewide and nationwide. One day you're teaching in a classroom, the next day you may be teaching on a farm, in a laboratory, or in a greenhouse. You teach technical skills one day and leadership skills the next. Your time and efforts help young people develop career, leadership, and life skills. You're helping develop future farmers of America, biologists, chemists, veterinarians, engineers, and entrepreneurs too. Two, FFA advisors, our hats are off to you. Our destination spotlight this week is Douthat State Park in Millboro. Amid some of Virginia's most breathtaking mountain scenery, visitors enjoy miles of stream fishing, a 50-acre lake stocked with trout, a sandy swimming beach, and a snack bar, boat and bicycle rentals, a gift shop, and camp store and cabins. Plus, there are more than 40 miles of hiking and mountain biking trails, an amphitheater, playgrounds, picnic areas, tent and trailer camping, a restaurant overlooking the lake, and nature and history programs. Douthat is one of the original six Virginia state parks that opened June 15, 1936. That does it for our show this week. Remember, if you have any questions, comments for us, visit our website at virginiafarming.com or find us on Facebook. Have a great week. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org.